remember to start recording. Um, and um, <clears throat> we're going to be talking more about reactions today and talking about balancing reactions a little bit more. Um, so we'll, we'll get started with doing some, um, some practice with balancing reactions. And then uh, we have one more periodic trend that's something we've mentioned before already, and it's related to ionization energy, um, but it's just presenting it in a different light that's going to help us determine what type of chemical reaction we have happening. Um, so let's go ahead and get started by having you, you guys practice balancing these four equations. Uh, and for those of you who were wondering, I did figure out what was wrong with that other um, reaction that we uh, we couldn't balance the other day. It was missing a two. Um, there was a it was supposed to be nitrogen dioxide, not nitrogen monoxide, and all of a sudden that makes it possible to balance it much easier before you get to any coefficients of ten. Um, but we'll still leave that one alone for right now and just work on these ones. So practice balancing these. I'm going to pause and uh, get ready to start filling in coefficients here in a minute. All right, I'm going to start working through some of these um, from the from the top down and try and give you some some of my logic as we're working through these. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so a couple things about this first reaction that are going to make it a lot easier for us to know how to balance it. Um, for starters. We have only compounds with even numbers of oxygen on the left-hand side, which means that no matter what we do with our coefficients on the left-hand side, we have to have an even number of oxygens. So that tells us that whatever we have on the right-hand side, we need to make sure that we have an even number of oxygens or else it's never going to work out. So since we have a five, for our oxygens on the right hand side that tells us right off the bat we need to we know we're going to need at least two of these compounds of this dinitrogen pentoxide you double it 
then all of a sudden you have an even number of oxygens. We have 10 oxygens now. <clears throat> so that's going to inform everything else we do because we now we know, okay, I know we have to get to a total of four nitrogens on the right-hand side. We've got an even number of oxygens on the right-hand side. We, we have four nitrogens on the right-hand side. So that means on the reactant side, we also need to have four nitrogens. Now, if we total everything up and see where we are, we should be able to just use O2 to finish balance things out. So now we've got a total of eight oxygens as um, nitrogen dioxide. We need to get to a total of 10 oxygens. So if we have two oxygens as O2, that gives us a total of 10, right? It's really hard when in uh, using handwriting to differentiate between zeros and oxygens. Um, so these are both oxygens that I'm showing here. So that gives us a total of 10 oxygens, which is what we needed, right? So now if we look back at and double check everything, we've got four nitrogens on the left. We've got four nitrogens on the right. We've got 10 oxygens on the left. We have 10 oxygens on the right. And if you really want to make it explicit, you can put a one as a coefficient in front of the, the oxygen there. But if it's not written, if you don't have a numbered coefficient in front of a compound, it's assumed to be one. <clears throat> All right, so the, the two key pieces here was the first one was just realizing we needed to have an even number of oxygens on the right-hand side, because no matter what we did on the reactant side, we were always going to have an even number of oxygens. And so another way of thinking about some of these is for some of these compounds, we can look at <clears throat> the, uh, the subscripts like P4O10, no matter what we do, we have to have at least four phosphoruses, right? There's no way around that, which tells us we need to have at least a four on the right-hand side. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, so if we, if we know we're going to have four um, four phosphoruses on both sides. Our phosphorus is now balanced. We're going to make up. So since we have oxygen coming from two different places, um, we can finish balancing the oxygen by balancing the, by using waters. So if we have a total of 10 oxygens on the left. Sorry, 10 oxygens from um from the tetra tetraphosphorus decoxide well we know we're going to have to have at least we need to get to a total of 16 oxygens on the right hand side four of these hydrogen phosphate compounds and each phosphate has four oxygens in it so four times four is 16 if 10 of them are going to come from the tetraphosphorus pentaoxide, the other six have to come from water. Now, all of a sudden, that gives us a total of 16 oxygens on both sides. Our phosphoruses are balanced. Our oxygens are balanced. And if we're lucky, then our hydrogens are balanced as well. If we're not lucky, then that just means that we have to go back and put a two in front of your, your lowest coefficient and try again and see if the next one works. But in this case, six waters, each water has two hydrogens, gives us a total of 12 hydrogens on the left, and four of these hydrogen phosphate compounds, and each of these compounds has three hydrogens in it. So that gives us 12 oxygen or hydrogens on the product side as well. <clears throat> 
So a lot of times, if you get most of your elements balanced, the last one or two elements will probably take care of themselves, or it tells you you just need to go back and try the next possibility. And so our final answer here for balancing was one tetraphosphorus decaoxide plus six waters turns into four phosphoric acids or H3PO4s. And we're balanced. And again, for to be explicitly clear, it's not required, um, but you can always put a one in front of this. And actually, sometimes, um, sometimes it's helpful. Sometimes I will write equations out, like on the test. Um, I would not mark you down for not doing this, but I will frequently have you balance things like N2 plus H2 goes to NH3, and I'll specifically write in blanks. If you have a blank written in, you might as well put the one in there. Again, I'm not going to mark you down if you don't do that. Um, but if I write the blanks in, you might as well put the one in. It's just going to make things easier. And while we're here, since I have this one written, you can balance this one as well. What's the first thing you notice about the nitrogens in this one? Actually, everything for that matter. On the left hand side, our nitrogen and our hydrogen are both even, right? We, there's no way we could ever get to an odd number of nitrogens or an odd number of hydrogens. But on the product side, that ammonia has odd number of each of them. So that tells us right off the bat, we're gonna have to do it too. It has to be, it has to be an even coefficient on the ammonia gas. Now, all of a sudden, if we had a one for the nitrogen, our nitrogens are balanced, and that gives us a total of six H's on the right-hand side. We need six H's on the left-hand side. Now we've got six H's on both sides. We've got two nitrogens on each side, so we're balanced. And since I didn't have a random chemistry application for for you today, since um, I had you guys uh, got all your questions answered, I think at this point, um, this is actually a very historically significant reaction um, because this allowed with this when this reaction was first done in a laboratory in the early 1900s. Um, up until that point, ammonium nitrate was the was one of the main components that, that was being used to make gunpowder. Uh, and explosives, and this was during World War I that this was first done in a lab, and it was done by a German chemist named, I think his name was Fritz, Fritz Haber, um, might have been Franz, something German, Austrian, some um, very typical, one of those very typical German names. Um, he found a way to do this, and this allowed the Germans to be able to produce their own ammonium nitrate in labs, where up until that point, ammonium nitrate had to be mined in South America. They had these big open pit mines where they would dig up ammonium nitrate and then ship it all over the world to make gunpowder. Um, so at the beginning of World War I, it was thought it was going to be a very short war because the Allies just blockaded um, Germany and Germany couldn't get any more ammonium nitrate until. Haber figured out how to make ammonium nitrate in a lab, and then they were able to make their own gunpowder without needing to ship in supplies from other countries. Um, so in that context, it was a very destructive compound, um, and figuring this reaction out caused a lot of, of uh, death and destruction because World War I then drug out for, dragged out for, what I think, what, 1912 to 1918 or something like that, um, a lot longer than it needed to. Um, 
But then after that, ammonium nitrate is now used as one of the main ingredients in fertilizer. So synthetic fertilizer is based around this reaction as well. And it allows us to just use hydrogen gas that we can generate from water and nitrogen gas that we can pull out of the atmosphere and make um, as much synthetic fertilizer as needed to be able to grow crops just about anywhere that you have water. So there's your fun fact for the day. Um, it's actually a really good book about that if you're interested in science history. Um, I have to look up the name for it. One of my other students told me about it. I think it's called the Alchemy of Air or something like that. Um, that uh, is supposed to be a very good book on, on that historical reaction. <clears throat> Anyway, back to balancing these other reactions. If we have this, um, this boron compound <clears throat> plus oxygen, it'll oxidize to make um, boron oxide and water. So again, if we look, if we start just by looking at um, oxygens, since we have even number of oxygens on the left-hand side, we know we are going to have to add up to an even number of oxygens on the right-hand side, but we already do. Three and one is even, right? So the oxygens aren't going to give us a whole lot of clues here. Our borons are already balanced <clears throat> because we have two borons on the left and two borons on the right. So the key here is going to be the hydrogens because we have we have six hydrogens on the left and all of our hydrogens are being converted into water which means we must have at least a 3 right here and no what no matter what we do if we change the coefficient in front of, front of that um, boron hydride compound, um, we're going to wind up working in multiples of three waters because we're always going to have six or 12 or 18 hydrogens on the left-hand side. It's always going to be a multiple of three. Hmm. So with that in mind, our borons are balanced, our hydrogens are balanced. We still have an even number of oxygens on both sides. We just now have three and three, so that gives us a total of six oxygens. So I believe that that's all we need to do here. And now again, double checking, two borons, two borons, six hydrogens, six hydrogens, six oxygens, six oxygens. Right there, so there's not always one process that's going to work all the time. Um, I can't just give you a, a follow this procedure and it will always end up balanced. Um, it's a little bit more like a like a logic puzzle a lot of times. Um, and it takes a little practice to be able to see them, but that's why we're practicing. On this last one, there's a couple things that we can that we can see. For starters, our chlorines are going to be interesting, right? Because we have four chlorines on the left and five chlorines on the right. So we know we're going to have to always have an even number of chlorines on both sides. So we could start by putting a two here because we know it, that coefficient in front of the uh, chromium three chloride is going to have to be an even number. That's the only way we get the right hand side to be, have an even number of chlorines. And that has the added benefit of it also balances our chromiums for us, right? By doing that, 
um, our chromiums are balanced, at least temporarily. The other, another key piece here is that we know we've got three oxygens on the left-hand side, and oxygen only shows up in one place on the right-hand side. So we know that we, we can start by putting a three there to see how that's going to work out. That kind of causes the cascade effect. Now, our, so our chromiums are balanced, our oxygens are balanced, um, but our carbons aren't. So hopefully, if we balance our carbons, that will take care of the chlorines as well. So we know we've got three carbons on the right-hand side, so let's put three carbons on the left-hand side. That gives us a total of 12 chlorines on the left. And on the right-hand side, we have six chlorines here and six chlorines here. So it did work out by balancing our chromiums and oxygens and carbons, our chlorines took care of themselves. All right, questions on balancing so far? Cool. Then with more practice, and like I said, this is one of those things where at the very least, you should always know if you're getting it wrong, because you should always be able to add up atoms. Right. So even if you get stuck on something and you're not sure it's why it's not working, you at least know it's not working. Um, which I always found to be helpful as a student. Um, I always liked to know I was getting it wrong, even if I didn't know the right answer, as opposed to thinking I had it right. So make sure you double check your your work on those, but um, checking your work should be the easy part. All right, so we're going to add our one one last major uh, periodic trend, and I mentioned it's tied to ionization energy. So ionization energy was how easy is it to take an electron away? from an element. So if there was low ionization energy, it was really easy to remove an electron. High ionization energy meant it was really hard to remove an electron. This next property is sort of the inverse of that. Um, it turns out when we have a covalent bond, when we're making a bond in between two non-metals, uh, non um, those electrons aren't generally shared evenly. Um, so if you have a what's called a pure covalent bond, then you wind up with those electrons being evenly split up between the two atoms and spread evenly around both of those atoms at the same time. Um, but that's actually fairly rare because what happens more frequently is one of your elements is going to be more electronegative than your other element. And so electronegativity is just the, is the tendency of um, of an atom to pull electrons towards itself. So in other words, it's the exact opposite of ionization energy. Ionization energy was about how easy it is to pull an electron away from something. I guess it's not really the opposite. High ionization energy is also high electron electronegativity. If it's hard to pull an electron away from something, then that element is also going to be tend to pull electrons towards itself in a covalent bond. So it's just another way of dressing up ionization energy. It's another way of thinking about the same concept. Um, and in general, we see the same, the same trend. The closer you get to the top right, the more electronegative elements are if we exclude the noble gases especially. Noble gases don't make covalent bonds under normal circumstances. So generally speaking, we just don't even consider them to have any electronegativity because they don't make covalent bonds. 
So out of everything that makes covalent bonds, more electronegative is to the top right of the periodic table, less electronegative is to the bottom left. And that's actually sort of just like with the ionization energy, that's sort of why we had this stair step division between metals and nonmetals. The closer you get to the top right, the less likely they are to give away an electron and the more likely they are to hoard an electron. Right. And so this actually gives us, this is actually a better way of thinking. Somebody asked a question about this on uh, last week's quiz um, regarding, um, well, you know, why, what happens with the metalloids? How come there's those metalloids that are kind of in between metals and non-metals? Um, and what happens when they make covalent bonds? What well, turns out that electronegativity is a better way of deciding whether something is ionic or covalent. Um, metal, non-metal uh, is going to be the one that we use all the time in this class. If you have a metal and a non-metal, it's always going to be an ionic bond. But, but if, we get, if we dig in a little bit deeper, there's actually sort of an arbitrary cutoff in this difference in electronegativity. If you have two atoms that are in a covalent bond and, they're, and the difference in their electronegativities is two or greater, then we consider that to be an ionic bond. If the difference is less than two, it's not really an ionic bond. It's, it's a covalent bond where the non-metal is going to have more of the electrons around it. It's a polar uh, covalent bond. All right, so it's less of a, of a black and white distinction between ionic and covalent, and it's more of a spectrum. You can have pure covalent bonds where their two atoms are identical as far as their electronegativity goes. You could have polar covalent bonds where there's a difference in electronegativity, but it's not that big of a difference. And then if, once you get above a certain threshold, and other, some textbooks will actually cut it off at 1.8. Um, I'm not going to be picky about that word. In this class, we're just going to use that. If it's a metal and a non-metal, call it ionic. Um, but it, yeah, once you get past that threshold, it's considered an ionic bond. Where you've got such a large difference in electronegativity that you're just going to say, okay, well, the one that's more electronegative is basically controlling the electrons. And the one that's less electronegative is, has essentially given away its electron. And this is, winds up being really helpful as well because um, well, we'll see it here in a second. Um, it allows us to classify different types of bonds. And this is kind of tying back into Vesper and, um, and drawing these Lewis dot structures as well. Um, because every time we have a covalent bond, it's going to fit into one of these three categories. All right, and this point four distinction between, between pure covalent bond or nonpolar covalent bond and a polar covalent bond is, a, again, is a little bit arbitrary. Any difference in electronegativity means you're going to have at least a little bit um, of an uneven sharing between the two atoms. Um, but that 0 0.4 is sort of our distinction, if it's more a larger difference than 0 0.4, we call it a polar bond. And the way that I always remember that number um, is that it's the same as the difference between carbon and hydrogen. Carbon and hydrogen are frequently considered to be very non, make very nonpolar molecules. Um, all, most organic molecules have mostly carbon and hydrogen bonds in it. Um, and so I use that as my way of remembering. If it's more polar than a carbon-hydrogen bond, then it's polar. If it's the same as a carbon-hydrogen bond or less of a difference in electronegativity, then it's, then it's nonpolar. So carbon and hydrogen are sort of our dividing line there. And so what we're really uh, looking, looking at is, as I mentioned before, we're looking at the difference in electronegativity. So if we wanted to know what the 
difference in electronegativity is that for a hydrogen and chlorine bond, we look at the electronegativity for hydrogen is 2.1 and chlorine is 3.0. So 3.0 minus 2.1, our difference in electronegativity then is 0 0.9. that fits squarely in the middle of this polar covalent section. It's a covalent bond, but the, but the electrons are not being shared evenly. The there's more of the electrons around the chlorine than there are around the hydrogen. And that that'll also allows us to, to describe things a little bit differently, even though we have a covalent bond, so everything has a full valence and, and these electrons are being shared, the fact that they're not being shared evenly means that you actually have what, um, what we call a partial charge at each end of this bond. Whatever element is more electronegative, um, we say it's got a partial negative charge. And so this that's the a Greek letter delta, and we um, a lowercase delta, uh, and we write it this way to differentiate it between other Greek. See, lowercase deltas show up in a lot of different fields. Um, math uses deltas, lowercase deltas that look like this to represent derivatives. Um, so chemists write them sep differently with this little tail at the top so that we can differentiate between the two lowercase deltas. Um, so a delta with a negative just means that it's not a whole negative charge. It's not like you actually have a full ion. It's still a covalent bond, but there's like a half of a negative charge. Like there's more, the, the electrons are not being shared evenly. So there's a little bit extra electron density around one side of the bond than the other. And the side that has the lower electron density is going to have a partial positive. All right, so just going back and reiterating, electronegativity is how much they pull electrons towards themselves. So more electronegative means a partial negative charge. Less electronegative is going to have a partial positive charge. So this HCl bond is going to be polar. And we could even draw it and say that there's a partial positive on the hydrogen and a partial negative on the chlorine. If we look at a carbon nitrogen bond, carbon's 2.5. And, and I can do a better five than that. If I go, yeah. Maybe I can't. That's better. And nitrogen is 3.0. So that difference, the difference between them is 0 0.5, which is bigger than our difference between carbon and hydrogen. It's above that 0.4 threshold, which tells us this also is a polar bond. Right. And if we wanted to say where the charge was, the nitrogen is more electronegative. So it's, let's say, a partial negative on the nitrogen and a partial positive on the carbon. Right. So if you have this table of electronegativities in front of you, these are really straightforward questions to answer. All you it's a little subtraction and then 
Um, if you don't have this figure in front of you, then you might need to um, remember where that cutoff is that where that makes it polar versus nonpolar. But beyond that, it's a pretty straightforward process to figure out which bonds are polar. Um, let's see, was there, what else was I going to cover on this one? So where it really starts being useful is when we combine this with Vesper geometries. Because knowing what bonds are polar is, is good. That's going to allow us to predict some, some important properties. But knowing what molecules are polar is even better. Because polar molecules have a lot of very specific macroscopic properties that we can see in a lab. Polar molecules dissolve better in water. Polar molecules have higher boiling points and have polar molecules are going to be more likely to be a solid or a liquid at room temperature. Right, so there are, there are um, several important properties that are tied to how polar a molecule is. And if you wind up taking organic chemistry, um, we'll find out that finding those partial positives and partial negatives are going to basically govern every reaction we talk about. Every reaction that happens in organic chemistry just about is here's a negative charge. It's attracted to a partial positive over there, and then something happens. Right. So knowing where these partial positives are winds up being pretty important. Um, if you don't have this chart in front of you, the one on the right, which I don't remember if it's on the equation sheet or not for this class. The easy way of remembering it is if you have any of the four that are that I boxed there um, bonded to anything else, it's going to be a um, it's going to be a polar bond. It's technically not anything else because a chlorine bonded to bromine is not technically polar, but that'd be a very very uncommon thing to have happen anyway. Chlorine and bromine don't generally bond with each other, so. If this, if this chart is not sitting in front of you and you need to answer this question, just look at, do I have nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, or chlorine attached to anything else? If you do have this chart, then just do your quick subtraction and compare it to carbon and hydrogen. Um, yes, I do not mind elaborating. So let's look at the carbon versus oxygen bond here, and we'll go over that as well. Um, so oxygen's 3.5, carbon is 2.5. So the oxygen is more electronegative than the carbon. The difference between these, the change in electronegativity here is gonna be 1.0. So that tells us it's a polar bond. If we want to know where the partial charges are, we need to look at which side was more electronegative, not just what the overall difference is. Whichever side of the bond was more electronegative is the one that's going to have more electrons around it. So that would mean that in this case, the oxygen would be the partial negative and the carbon would be the partial positive. All right. So if we just remember that electronegativity is the tendency to hog the electrons. Um, you can think of it as the more the most electronegative elements are, are just bullies. They're sharing toys, but it's not really sharing. It's really the fluorine gets the toys and the hydrogen's just along for the ride. Right? So the more electronegative gets to keep the toys, gets to keep the electrons. All right, any other? Questions on this page so far? All right, so let's apply that to Vesper geometries. I have a quick question, Sean. Will you need us yeah. to um, notate those delta negatives or positives since it's just a common known fact when we um, write out answers? For, for this class, not, not unless I specifically ask you to write where the partial charges are, where the charge distribution is. Um, and we'll talk about 
why that's useful to show in a second. Um, no, but to just to answer the question the way it was written here, which bonds are polar, you just um, would just do the subtraction and see which where you had those differences greater than okay, 0. 0.4. So let's say we have a covalent molecule, um, CH3F. In organic nomenclature, this would be fluoromethane. Um, also re be related to compounds that uh, are responsible for depleting the ozone layer, um, which are CFCs, which stands for chlorofluorocarbons. We had an, a chlorine on here as well. It would be a chlorofluorocarbon. Um, in this case, if we look at the, um, at the Lewis dot structure, is going to tell us what types of bonds we have. And then once we have that Lewis dot structure written, we can look at each of the individual bonds and say, that one's polar, that one's not. So in this case, we wanna put whatever it has the most vacancies or is the least electronegative is gonna go in the middle. So carbon would go in the middle. Then we'd start by just putting everything else that we have around it. And we know we have, if we totaled up all our valence electrons, we get four valence from the carbon, three valence electrons, and our three hydrogens, and each hydrogen has one valence electron. So that's three valence electrons from the hydrogen and seven electrons from the fluorine. My stylus really does not like when I try to do negative charges just turns them into a dot. All right, so that gives us a total of 14 valence electrons to work with. And we know that eight of them are going to be tied up in these bonds. We know that the hydrogens and the fluorine have to be connected. So we know that a chunk of our electrons we have to work with are going to be um, in those bonds between the fluorine and the carbon and the hydrogens and the carbon. So that out of our 14 electrons that used eight of them, which means we have six electrons left. And what still needs more electrons to have a full valence? Hydrogens are good, right? Fluorine, exactly. Hydrogens are good because every hydrogen has two electrons and that's all it needs to fill that first energy level. Carbon's good because it has eight electrons. So Our last six electrons would go around the fluorine. And again, I like to show, so I can count by twos more easily without, and you can tell that they're there. If you can't see my dots, um, I like to put the little loop around lone pairs. So which bonds do we have that are, Polar. We only have two types of bonds, really, right? We have carbon hydrogen bonds and we have a carbon fluorine bond. So our carbon hydrogen bond, exactly. So the carbon hydrogen bond was our definition of nonpolar. So if you have a carbon hydrogen bond, you know right away. It's nonpolar. Carbon and fluorine, on the other hand, well, fluorine has an electronegativity of 4.0. Carbon is 
So for the green bond, the bond that's circled in green, our change in electronegativity is 1.5. It's a pretty polar bond, way more polar than a carbon-hydrogen bond. So our carbon-fluorine bond, we would write as being polar. Right, so all of this is building to the fact that um, if you have a polar bond in a molecule, your molecule as a whole is going to have part of it, might have part of it that is more negative than the rest of it. You might have a partial charge on part of your molecule. And so in this case, Um, we can actually plot this. You can, we can actually have the computers run run calculations of where the lowest way we can mix these orbitals together all works out. And we can actually wind up showing that um, fluoromethane has a pretty strong partial negative right around the fluorine and a partial positive on the other side of the molecule. Right, so if this is the the most important skill from knowing if you have polar bonds, the next step is to know whether that makes your whole molecule polar. Because if you have a, a polar molecule, that's going to have a lot of those properties that we actually can measure in a lab, um, such as higher boiling point, um, more solubility in water, et cetera. All right. And so to know if that's the case or not, We don't just need polar bonds. We need enough charge being pulled to one side of the entire molecule. So that we basically are going to have two criteria to know if we have an overall polar molecule. Um, and so if something is polar, that just means the definition of polar just means that you have more charge on one side of the molecule than the other side of the molecule means that your electrons are not evenly dispersed around the entire molecule. Um, it's also known as a dipole. A polar molecule has a what's called a dipole moment, meaning that there's a positive side and a negative side. So dipole, di meaning two. Um, so a dipole just means it's got a partial positive side and a partial negative side. So polar molecules have, by definition, have a net dipole. And here are two requirements. If it's a polar molecule, it has to have both polar bonds, which makes sense. You can't have a polar molecule without polar bonds. But you also have to have an asymmetric shape. And I'm, I didn't catch this when I was prepping. Um, I don't even think unsymmetrical is a word. There's two M's in there. So it's not just that it has polar bonds. You also have to have some asymmetry, meaning that the electrons are not shared evenly around the whole molecule. You can have molecules that have polar bonds that are not polar molecules because the bonds are polar in exactly opposite directions. You can think of it sort of like, um, like playing tug of war. A polar bond is, uh, is like an NFL team playing tug of war with a high school team, high school football team. The NFL team is going to be pulling the rope towards itself, right? But if you, have, if you have two NFL teams pulling in exactly opposite directions, even though they're both really electronegative, you're not going to have any net motion. There's no net pull towards one side or the other. And that's where the, asy the asymmetry comes into play. So, and this is why Vesper geometries wind up being important, um, is that if you look at carbon dioxide, well, we just got done saying that carbon to oxygen is a polar bond. 
but carbon dioxide, the Vesper geometry of carbon dioxide only has two electron domains, right? So going back to our definitions from last week, that makes it a linear molecule. If it's a linear molecule and our two polar bonds are pointing in exact opposite directions from each other, they kind of cancel each other out. So carbon dioxide is a nonpolar molecule, despite the fact that it has polar bonds. Water, on the other hand, is bent. It has asymmetry. The oxygen is pulling the electrons more closely towards itself. And it's not equal in all four directions. It's got a, a tetrahedral electron geometry, right? But the fact that two of its hydrogens are pointed in more or less the same direction means that it can be a polar molecule. That's that asymmetry that we're talking about. All right, so to be a polar molecule, you need both of these criteria to be satisfied. And generally speaking, if, if it's not on a test for this class, if I just say, is this a polar molecule or not? The easiest thing to check is the first criteria. It's a lot easier to tell if there's polar bonds than it is to go through the whole process of drawing the Vesper geometry and deciding if it's symmetric or not. Um, because if you can say no to the first criteria, then you don't even need to bother with the second criteria. All right, so we're going to take a break here. When we come back, we're going to review that and we're going to decide which of these molecules are polar or nonpolar. All right, so let's take 10 minutes plus an extra three to give you guys a head start. Let's come back at 2.35 and we'll start working through these. <laughs> 
Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start working through these. I'm going to use my, uh, my uh, whiteboard since there's not room on this slide. Um, so switch over here. All right, so the first step in figuring out if we have any polar bonds here is going to be determining if we, or sorry, if we have any po a polar molecule. Yeah, I'd give my computer a second to catch up apparently. Um, we need to decide whether or not we have any polar bonds, but since for this example, and this is going to be similar to the way it's written on the test, um, you don't necessarily want to start with, do I have polar bonds? Because if I'm going to make you draw the Lewis dot structure in the Vesper geometry anyway, um, you might as well just start with that. And then we'll figure out um, if there are polar bonds as well in the asymmetry part. So for the first one, if we have C, H2O, CH2O is going to give us a total of we have four electrons from the carbon, two times one electron for the hydrogens, and six valence electrons for the oxygen. That's going to give us a total of 12 electrons. So keep tabs on that off, off to the side somewhere. Our central atom is, has to be the carbon um, because hydrogen can only make one bond, right? It only needs to gain two electrons to be stable. And so you're never going to have hydrogen as a central atom because it can only make one bond. It only will ever have one pair of electrons at most. So other than the hydrogen, our least electronegative element is our carbon. So carbon is going to go in the middle. Then on either side of that, we can put our hydrogens and our oxygen. And we can start by bonding everything together. So we know at least that we have these, these three bonds there. So we just use six electrons, which means we have six electrons left. Our hydrogens are stable. They have full valences already. So that means our oxygen is our next place. And so I generally go from the outside in when I'm doing this, because your more electronegative elements are the ones that are more, imp more important to make sure they have a full valence. So the oxygen needs to gain another six electrons to be completely stable. And we have six electrons left. And write them in so is our Lewis dot structure done we used up all of our electrons what's our second criteria for Lewis dot structure First non-negotiable one is you have to use the right number of electrons, right? That's that's not something we can really um, we can really fiddle with because we only have 12 valence electrons total. Our next criteria is if possible, we want to fill all the valences. Oxygen's stable, hydrogens are stable, carbon still needs a pair of electrons. So if we want to fill carbon's valence without, and we can't just put a pair of electrons there because then we wouldn't be using our 12 electrons. We'd be making electrons up out of nowhere. We don't want to do that. So that's when we make a double bond. Basically, we make oxygen share another pair of electrons. It had three lone pairs. We make it share one of those lone pairs with the carbon, and now everything has a full valence. So here's our Lewis dot structure. 
in from the Lewis thought structure, getting the electron geometry and the molecular ge geometry is not too tricky. Right, we might want to redraw it so we can draw things with proper angles so we can see what's happening a little bit more. But we have three electron groups. If we have three electron or electron domains, is the other term, right? We have three electron domains because even though this is a double bond, even though this has four electrons, two pairs of electrons, they're both both pairs of electrons are stuck in between the carbon and the oxygen. So spatially, it can only take up one electron domain. So if we're drawing this out, looks something like this, and we can put the two lone pairs on the oxygen, well, if we want to. So if we're trying to determine the electron geometry of the central atom, it's always just based on how many electron domains you have, right? We have one electron domain, two electron domains, three electron domains, three things taking up space around that carbon. Now, one of them is bigger than the others, but it's still three things taking up space. So our electron geometry What's the electron geometry if we have three? Bingo, somebody already threw it in there. Three electron domains means you can have at most 120 degrees between those electron domains, which means it's our electron geometry is trigonal planar. Trigonal meet like triangular, three of them, planar meaning flat. Is our um, molecular geometry any different than our electron than our electron geometry in this case? No, so remember that the difference, electron geometry versus molecular geometry, electron geometry was only different if you couldn't see what was at the end of some of these electron domains, if there was no nucleus. In other words, if you had lone pairs. If you have lone pairs, then you can't necessarily tell what's there. Um, you can just see that it takes up space. So our molecular geometry would also be trigonal planar. Last but not least, the whole reason we went through this whole process is to determine if this is a polar molecule or not. So now that we know the shape, we can look at it and say, okay, well, this part of the molecule is going to have more electron density than the other part. Because we do, in fact, we look at the difference in electronegativity between carbon and hydrogen, that's going to be nonpolar. But carbon to oxygen is a polar bond. Right, because the oxygen is pulling electrons more strongly than the carbon is, there's a, going to be a partial negative charge around the oxygen. And since that bond is not the same in all three directions around this, this central carbon, that's our asymmetry. This is an asymmetric molecule because the electron density is being pulled up pretty strongly by the oxygen, and it's not matched by any bonds pulling electrons downward. Right, so anytime asymmetry is actually really, it's a little bit tricky to wrap your head around, but it's really easy to test for.
any time that whatever you have around your central atom, if you have one thing that's different than the others, then it's asymmetric. So that one thing that's different could be a lone pair. It could be a hydrogen versus an oxygen. It could be a chlorine instead of a hydrogen. Whatever it is, if any one of the three things around our trigonal plane or carbon, if any one of those three things is different than the others, then it's asymmetric. Right? So it's not just symmetric like think back to when you first learned the term and you know having a mirror image and it's the same on both sides. It needs to be the same in all directions from this central carbon. So there's some other topics I want to make sure we get a chance to cover today. So I'm going to go fast through the next example. Um, because I think that you guys got enough practice with Vesper geometries and Lewis dot structures, um, and probably even saw this one as an example. Um, carbon tetrachloride. It's going to be a carbon with four electron groups. And each one of those electron groups is a chlorine. So, and then each of these chlorines would have three lone pairs around it as well. We're counting up all of our, our um, electrons as well, but for the sake of just showing the symmetry, um, our molecular geometry and our electron geometry would both be tetrahedral, right? Four electron groups around a central atom was always going to be tetrahedral, which got us that 109 degrees apart from each other. The reason I wanted to show this example is because each of these bonds individually is polar, right? So we definitely have polar bonds. So now the question becomes, is it asymmetric? And that's exactly right. It's polar bonds, but it's the same in all directions. This doesn't look like it's a symmetric molecule necessarily, not the way if you're used to just drawing a mirror plane and seeing it's the same. But when you think about making this a four-sided tug of war, all of these, each one of these chlorines is exactly opposite from the other three. And they're all going to wind up canceling each other out completely. So asymmetry? No. So that makes it a nonpolar molecule. Right, the whole idea is that you have to be able to say yes to both of these for it to be a polar molecule. We have a tetrahedral electron geometry, and all four of them are exactly identical. All four electron, electron domains are identical. Therefore, it's nonpolar. All right. I'm going to go back to the slides. I'm going to leave the last one for now. Um, the last one does wind up being a polar molecule. Um, but I'm not going to work through that example at this point for the sake of being able to get to our next section here, which is um, now that we're used to dealing with reactions and balancing reactions, um, the next step is generally classifying reactions. And this is one that's kind of contentious. Um, so there's, depending on what textbook you look at, there's a million and one different ways that you can classify chemical reactions. And it depends on what your field is. Organic chemists have a different classification of reactions than biochemists do. And those are both different than inorganic chemists. And those are both different, all three different than, um, I don't know, say a, a physical chemist or a uh, physicist or a nuclear chemist. So 
you a lot of textbooks or if you look up reaction types you're going to see a lot of words like this like synthesis decomposition single replacement double replacement but if you look somewhere else you'll see um precipitation versus acid base versus oxidation reduction and combustion or addition decomposition and neutralization or many matrix of mechanisms if you're in organic chemistry or here's a biochemistry classification we're going to simplify all that for this class we're going to classify our reactions into only two types each of those is going to have subtypes but the most important classification for any chemical reaction is either you move electrons or you don't if electrons are changing hands or nuclei, but if you're changing the number of electrons that an atom has, that's one type of reaction. If you're mixing and matching your pieces and you're, you're combining them in a different way, but everything ends up with the same charge and the same number of electrons it started with, that's our other type of reaction. And so, The, these two reaction types, if you have electrons changing hands, we call that an oxidation reduction reaction, or redox for short. So electrons are never stable enough to just stay on their own. So if you have electrons being stripped away from one thing, they're being given to something else. And so these oxidation reduction reactions are you always are two parts of the same coin. If you have something losing electrons, something else has to gain electrons. So redox is the combined form of that. A redox reaction means that you're moving electrons around. And if you have reactions where electrons are not changing hands, where you're moving atoms around, but everything is the same charge before and after, that's a more broad classification. Um, and so I, the word that I've been using to describe that type of reaction is a complexation reaction. And I'm, what I mean by that is that you're changing what's attached to what, but not where the electrons are. So you're making different complexes of ions or atoms. Um, the other way to think about it is that these are, and this is not an official term, Lego reactions. Got the same pieces before and after, you're just arranging them in, different, in a different order or different configuration. Right, so redox reactions change what you actually have. You're changing the charge on something. These complexation reactions or Lego reactions, everything stays the same charge. You're just changing up the pieces the way they're combined. All right, so between these two, there are some common reaction types that that are sort of um, subcategories. Um, so, and we'll go through each of these individually. So don't don't panic too much if I go quickly on this part. Um, you'll get a chance to see these again later. A metal metal redox means that you actually have metal ions changing charge, or you have elements changing charge where you're going from a neutral charge to a negative charge or going from a neutral charge to a positive charge or a positive charge to a different positive charge. Um, and those are usually pretty easy to see. Combustion reactions are a little bit harder to see that it's in, that electrons are changing hands. And we'll talk about how we can do that in a second. But a combustion reaction is always going to be something where you've got carbons 
and hydrogens reacting with oxygen. And they're always going to make the same two things, CO2 and water. Now, depending on what your compound is, if there's nitrogen involved or if your carbon compound has a sulfur in it, there might be other little side products. But for the most part, if it's what's called a complete combustion, you're starting with carbon and hydrogen and maybe an oxygen, and you're turning it into CO2 and water. And so those are actually really easy to recognize. Anytime you've got something with carbon and reacting with oxygen, it's turned to CO2 and water. It's always a combustion reaction. Um, and there are other oxidation, other redox reactions as well. So a metal, metal redox, and again, I, I think I have, I have um, examples here in a minute, um, but a metal, metal redox would be something like, um, we, we talked about silver polish and silver tarnish the other day, right? Um, if you have silver oxide reacting with zinc metal, and that turns into zinc oxide and silver metal. This is a classic example of a metal metal redox because at the beginning, the charge on your silver was plus one and the charge on your zinc was zero. But at the end, you made zinc oxide, which means the zinc over here has to be two plus and your silver is zero. So a metal metal redox is always going to have a metal ion changing charge. You're either starting as a neutral metal and turning it into an ion, or you're starting as an ion or turning it into the neutral metal, or you can start as one charge and turn it into a different charge for some of our, our metals that can have mul multiple stable charges. But it's always going to be recognizable just by watching the charge on an individual element before and after. If the charge on an element is changing, it's a redox reaction. And again, there's more examples coming up here in a minute. <clears throat> um, precipitation reactions and acid-base reactions. Remember, this was our, our Lego reactions. Everything is still the same. If you had a polyatomic ion before, you still have the same polyatomic ion. If you had a metal ion before, it's still the same metal ion. They just might be present in a different form. Um, they might have started dissolved in water and now they've turned into a solid is the most common way you see this. And acid-base reactions mean that everything is still exactly as it was, except you moved, instead of moving an electron around, you moved an H plus, a hydrogen atom. You just moved it from one compound to another compound. Right, so, but nothing is changing charge <clears throat> in these Lego reactions, in the complexation reactions. Right, so for acid base reactions, are a little bit tricky to follow sometimes because it looks like things are changing charge a little bit. Um, be, because you're adding an H plus around. So for instance, if you had um, HCl plus um, NaOH reacting to form H2O and NaCl. If we look at all the individual pieces here, nothing is changing charge really. Your chloride starts with a negative one charge and it still has a negative one charge. Your sodium starts with a plus one charge and still has a plus one charge. Your hydroxide was OH minus, and then you had an H plus over here attached to the chlorine. We just stuck those two together. And if you put an H plus with OH minus, you get two hydrogens and an oxygen with a charge that adds up to zero. So nothing, we moved, all we did is we moved an H plus 
from here and stuck it on the hydroxide. And that gave us H2O. So nothing changed, nothing really changed charge in the course of this reaction, right? So anytime you, you wind up um, with hydroxide as a reactant and you, and you make water as a product, that's an acid-base reaction. Um, anytime you're starting with an acid as a reactant, meaning anything that looks like an ionic compound, but um, where your positive ion is hydrogen, that's a clue that it might be an acid-base reaction. And I'll give you the, the foolproof way, the 100% way of telling whether or not something is a redox reaction in just a, a couple slides. Um, precipitation reactions are another really, really common reaction to see, uh, especially at this level of chemistry, because it's, it's a reaction where you can take two clear colorless solutions and mix them together and you make a bright yellow solid um, by mixing together two colorless solutions. Um, but nothing changes charge in these. So the criteria is generally that you're going to have to start with two aqueous ionic reactants. And when you mix them together, you wind up making a combination that doesn't dissolve in water anymore. So you make a solid product, which is also known as a precipitate or abbreviated PPT. A precipitate is just a combination of ions that doesn't dissolve in water anymore. So one example of a precipitation reaction would be something like um, silver nitrate aqueous plus, um, let's do NaCl again, salt water. When you put these two together, silver and chloride, silver ions and chloride ions actually stick together so well that water doesn't dissolve them. So you wind up making a product that's a solid, and then whatever's left that doesn't, is not part of the solid we made, winds up sticking together too. So NaNO3, silver or sodium nitrate, is still dissolved. This reaction is a precipitation reaction. It's not a redox reaction because, again, silver started with a plus one charge and nitrate started with a minus one charge. Sodium started with a plus one, chloride started with a minus one. In our products, everything still has the same charge. The silver is still plus one. The chloride is still minus one. So if everything still has the same charge, nothing really changed form other than we, we made this weird combination that sticks together and doesn't dissolve in water anymore. So we made a solid out of two solutions. But we didn't change any charges. That's the key. Um, redox reactions, like I said, if it's metal metal redox, they tend to be really easy to recognize because you can just look at the charges on the, on the metals before and after. If you have a charge that's changing on a metal before and after, it's 100% a redox reaction. So in this case, sodium metal with zinc um, with zinc ion turning to sodium ion and zinc metal. Sodium starts neutral, goes to a plus one. The zinc starts as a plus two and goes to neutral. So we definitely have electrons changing hands because those atoms are changing charge. And again, here's another example of a combustion reaction. 
Something with carbons and hydrogens reacts with oxygen to make CO2 and water. It's always going to look the same. The balancing is going to be different depending on what the, your starting compounds are. Um, sometimes the phases might be different. You might start with a liquid. For instance, if you started with octane, you were burning, um, combusting octane. Octane is C8H18. Plus oxygen goes to CO2 and water. This is another case that the balancing is going to have to be different because we have more carbons per molecule, this one. But it's always plus O2 goes to CO2 and water. All right, these are the most two most common types of, of redox reactions. There are others that are referred to as gas evolution reactions or decomposition reactions or synthesis reactions that all have specific meanings, um, but they're all just different ways of describing a redox reaction. And so our criteria for whether or not something is a redox reaction, it's not always as easy as recognizing those two. Our criteria for determining whether something is a redox reaction or not is whether the oxidation state is changing. Now, in most cases, if it's a single atom we're talking about, oxidation state is just the charge. If it's in its elemental state and it's neutral, it's got an oxidation state of zero. If it's an ion, an atomic ion that's a single ion, um, atom with a charge, then the oxidation state is just that charge. And same, if you have an ionic compound, you can break apart that compound into its individual pieces and just say, okay, well, if I have sodium chloride, the sodium, the overall charge is zero, but I know that this is a sodium ion with a plus one and a chloride with a minus one, because those are the charges that are stable for those ions. Um, if I if I had Fe2O3, well, I know oxide when it's stable is always a negative two charge, right? And that means that we can tell that the iron must be plus three. Those are the oxidation states. If it's a simple, what we call a binary compound, meaning it's just two atoms, two ions that add up to a charge of zero, the oxidation state is just the charge. And if the oxidation state changes, it's a redox reaction. If you have covalent bonds, it's harder to tell what's happening with the oxidation state. So for instance, if we had our, here's the, the other part of this is the oxidation state is always adds up to the overall charge. So with ionic compounds, we're used to thinking about it that way, right? We need the overall charges to add up to zero. Um, for ion or for covalent compounds, if we want to assign the oxidation state, we still need their oxidation states to add up to zero if it's a neutral compound. So for instance, if we had PCL3, phosphorus trichloride. We need the oxidation states on all of these atoms to add up to zero because the charge on the overall compound is zero. So if co with covalent compounds, this is why we spent the first half of lecture talking about electronegativity. Because the most electronegative elements get first dibs on the electrons, basically. 
So if we want, we're basically going to assign their oxidation state so that whatever is most electronegative gets its standard charge. So for instance, out of phosphorus and chlorine, chlorine is more electronegative than phosphorus. If chlorine is more electronegative than phosphorus, then when we look at this compound, we can say, okay, well, the oxidation state on the chlorine is going to be negative one because it gets first dibs. The phosphorus is less electronegative, so the phosphorus has to have whatever oxidation state it needs to to make the total add up to zero. So in this case, the phosphorus would have to be plus three because you have three chlorides that are all negative one. So your phosphorus has to counteract all three of those to give you an, an overall charge of zero. And if it's not an, a neutral compound, if it's a polyatomic ion, like let's say phosphate, PO4 with a three minus, we can still figure out the oxidation state for this. We just need the oxidation states to add up to three minus instead of adding up to zero. And again, the process with this is always make your most electronegative element uh, stable, satisfy your most electronegative element, and then whatever is left, make it the char whatever charge it has to be to, to make it add up to negative three in this case. So if we have four oxides and they're each minus two, that's a total of negative eight from the, from the oxides. Therefore, the phosphorus has to have a positive charge. It has to have the right positive charge to make it add up to three minus. So it has to be a plus five. Roll your crash. No, it's not. All right, so it's a. There are a few exceptions. There's a few general rules that you can usually um, use. For instance, hydrogen is more electronegative than all of the metals, and it's less electronegative than the non-metals. So hydrogen is going to be a plus one or a minus one, depending on whether it's attached to a metal or a non-metal. Um, and you know for there are a couple cases with hydrogen where, um, because hydrogen only ha can only have a charge of negative one, zero, or plus one, because it can only starts with one electron to begin with, and it can only gain at most, um, a, get up to a total of two electrons. Hydrogen is a little bit weird with some of these. It's generally going to be either plus one or negative one. Or if it's in its elemental state, it's zero. But for the most part, it's a pretty straightforward process. It's a lot like figuring out your formulas for ionic compounds. Make the charges add up to whatever they need to be. So for Ionic compounds, again, it's just whatever the individual charges are. For sodium oxide, well, we know the oxygen is two minus, so the oxidation state for the oxygen is negative two. The sodium, when it's a charge, has to be a plus one. So it's just like working backwards from the formula to figure out the name, right? We started by figuring out what the individual ions were. For magnesium carbonate, 
we have the same thing. Magnesium, when it's neutral or when it's an ion, is always plus two. Which means then we have this carbonate. So we have to look at the individual atoms in carbonate because carbonate is going to is CO3 with a negative two charge. So now to figure out the oxidation state of the carbon versus the oxygen, we still go back to our same rules. More electronegative element gets satisfied first. So the oxygen is going to be negative two. The carbon is whatever it has to be to make the overall charge add up to negative two. So three oxides that are all negative two would be negative six. So the carbon has to be plus four. All right, so how does this tie back to redox reactions? Sorry, we have a, a Nerf gun battle and lots of screaming happening in my hallway right now. <clears throat> um, what does this have to do with redox reactions? This is how you tell if electrons change hands. If the oxidation state changes on an atom from reactants to products, it's a redox reaction, full stop. Very rarely do I make absolute statements like that, but that is one of them. If the oxidation state changes, it's a redox reaction. If the oxidation state doesn't change, if nothing changes oxidation state, it's one of those complexation, the, one of those Lego reactions. Right, and so we can go through this the second row is a good example because it shows you that you can have multiple oxidation states, even on some of these non-metals. We did the oxidation state on phosphorus trichloride, and we wound up with plus three <clears throat> and negative one. Each of the chlorides is negative one because it's most electronegative. And then the phosphorus has to counteract those three negative ones to make it add up to zero. If we look at calcium phosphide, now it's an ionic compound, and we can just break it up into the individual ions. Calcium, when it's, when it's an ion, is always plus two, because it's in column two of the periodic table. Phosphide is always going to is negative three, because it needs to gain three electrons to get to a noble gas. When it's an, when phosphide, when phosphorus has a negative charge, it's negative three. So between these two compounds, phosphorus trichloride and calcium phosphide, phosphorus has a plus three oxidation state in one and a negative three oxidation state in the other. And if you look at phosphorus pentachloride, Phosphorus pentachloride, the chloride, once again, it's still the most electronegative element, right? So it still needs to be a negative one because it needs to be stable. And there are five of them, which means our phosphorus has to be what? Plus five, bingo. Right, and so, Once again, this is our foolproof way of seeing if something's redox or not, All right? And with, within redox, you can, like I said, there are lots of different types of reactions that are redox reactions, but if it's not one of those two most common, if it's not a metal-metal redox or a combustion reaction, you are okay just saying it's a redox reaction, and I don't know how to classify it beyond that. And same with the 
um, with the complexation reactions. If it's not an acid base reaction and it's not a precipitation reaction, but nothing is changing oxidation state, you, then you could still just say, well, I don't know what type of reaction this is, but it's definitely a complexation reaction or it's definitely a Lego reaction. Nothing's changing oxidation state. And those are our two biggest ways of classifying these reactions. <clears throat> all right, last thing. So you have all the tools needed for your homework. I know I'm at time here, but I'll go quick. <clears throat> Is when we put the oxidation states in the context of the reaction, we can look at them as being either oxidized or reduced. And that's where that there was a memnonic on the last on one of the last slides. Um, it was Leo says Gur, Leo the lion says Gur is what I've found to be the most effective way of remembering this. Leo stands for lose electron. is oxidation. And gaining electrons is reduction. So, Leo says Ger, losing electrons is oxidation, gaining electrons is reduction, which seems backwards because the word reducing usually means that there's less. Um, think of it in terms of the charge. The charge is being reduced when you gain an electron. That's what makes it a reduction. Right, so for this reaction here, sodium is going from a zero to a plus one. And hydrogen, the oxygen is negative two, which makes the hydrogen plus one in water. Over here, the oxygen's still negative two. On hydroxide, the hydrogen is still plus one. But the charge on hydrogen, the oxidation state of hydrogen as a gas, as H2, is zero because it's neutral. So hydrogen is going from plus one to zero. That means hydrogen is being reduced. Sodium is going to from zero to plus one, so it lost an electron. So sodium is being oxidized. I know that was quick, but now I'm going to turn it on, turn it on its head. If hydrogen is being reduced, that means it's oxidizing whatever we put it with, which means we can actually switch our frame of reference and call it the oxidizing agent. It's agent in the, the English sense, the agent is the one who's doing something. The oxidizing agent is being reduced. Whatever's being oxidized then is a reducing agent. Right, so it seems a little bit flipped, but it's basically because we're flipping our frame of reference. If the hydrogen is being reduced, it's oxidizing whatever you put it with. And, and in that context, it is causing oxidation by being reduced. You just have to be very specific with our language with these. Um, 
in order to answer these questions. So we would say that the sodium metal is the reducing agent. The water is the oxidizing agent, or the hydrogen is the oxidizing agent because the hydrogen is being reduced. And with that, I think that's everything we need for your, make sure you can finish the homework this week. Um, I will double check that before lab and uh, I'll send out an email either alter altering the assignment or with a clarification if there was anything that we didn't get to in lecture this week that you need for the homework. Um, so watch that, especially if you are trying to do the homework and you're confused on something, I might adjust that. Um, all right, let's end there. And um, as, as usual at this point, if you have lab with me in, in supposed to be in five minutes, let's make that 10 minutes, 335, we'll start lab.